Welcome to Budget with Upstocks. I'm Monica Hallam, and this is a pre-budget series where we discuss issues both macro and micro. This panel is about delving deep into the macro issues before Budget 2024. Budget 2024 comes at a very interesting time. We have a consolidating fiscal book with the government. Borrowings are largely under control and tax revenues are looking good. The twin balance sheet problems of banks and corporates are also sorted. But we see storm clouds gathering with consumption growth slowing and private sector investment yet to take off. The government has pushed the pedal on capital expenditure over the past few budgets. But unless the private sector takes the baton over, we might see growth faltering. There are also issues of inequality and jobs growth in front of this budget. These are some of the issues that this panel will decode. I have a very eminent panel of experts who will help me think through some of the possible scenarios ahead of this budget. I have with me Mr. M. Damodaran. He needs no introduction. Well known as the chairman of SEBI, he's also called the turnaround man. He successfully prevented both UTI and IDBI from failing at a very crucial time in the financial history of India. He's well known for his work in the space of corporate governance and now runs an advisory, Excellence Enablers. He also serves on many boards of top companies. And we also have Dr. Sajid Chinoy, who is Managing Director and Chief India Economist at JP Morgan, where he has been since 2010. He's also currently serving a second term as a part-time member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. We have Dr. Niranjan Rajadhaksh. Niranjan is an old colleague of mine from Mint and is now Executive Director at Artha India Research Advisors a public policy consulting firm. He was earlier the research director at IDFC Institute and executive editor at Mint, where he continues to write a fortnightly column on economics. Thank you so much for joining me on this very important debate that we hope to have. So I want to start this discussion by saying that actually in the budget, which is really the uh, revenue and the expenditure that the union government makes, which today stands about 50 trillion rupees in that ballpark zone. The elbow room is really a few, it's not that much, it's a few thousand crores because, you know, 85% of the budget is spoken for in terms of subsidies, defense, pensions, transfers to states. So it's just a few trillion rupees here and there on which this entire debate really sort of centers. It is the way in which the government spends this money gives us a direction as to the priorities of the government. For the last few budgets, we know it's been fiscal consolidation and capital expenditure. Fiscal consolidation essentially for all of you means that the government wants to control how much it borrows. It doesn't want to get into a place where the debt and the debt servicing becomes unserviceable. So the focus has been on that and in the last few budgets, it's been on capital formation, which means the government induced infrastructure building. This budget looks as if possibly a trigger to consumption might be the issue. So I want to just go around the table, Niranjan, maybe starting with you to say how, what are what is the big one issue which faces this budget? Thanks, Monica. I think that uh, you're correct that the entire budget is going to be designed in the backdrop of a fiscal glide path which has been announced that every year uh, you know the government is trying to bring down its fiscal deficit uh, this year undoubtedly one of the d sort of dark clouds on the indian economy is slowing personal consumption household consumption and we can go into the reasons for it can the budget per se give a boost to household consumption i don't think so at the margins you may have a tax cut or payments for uh, you know programs such as the PM Kisan or the wages on uh, the NREGS program could be in. So there's some money which could go into household uh, incomes. But I don't think beyond that the budget per se can on its own turn around the consumption story. I think for that you need job creation. Okay, Sajid. So, kind of, uh, as Niranjan said, great, great to be here, Monica. Um, we have to first recognize that the government's on this fiscal consolidation path. And, and what that means is that the fiscal impulse is actually tightening 
right? So this is the opposite of a stimulus. There was a lot of stimulus generated in the pandemic 2020, 21, but now we've got to tighten our belt, so to speak. So I think the, the recognition here is the envelope, the overall envelope has to tighten, has to narrow, right? Uh, I think that's the first recognition here. Now, the question that you will ha you'll have is there are both fiscal kind of near-term tactics and long-term strategy. The tactics is how quickly do you want to tighten your belt? Uh, and last year, the government kind of over-delivered on its fiscal consolidation. They've gone from 6.4% to 56 which is more than was envisaged. And this year, they need to go from 56 to 5.1%. So the first question is, will we go to 5.1% or will we tighten even further? My preference is, for the reasons Niranjan mentioned, while we need to reduce the deficit in the medium term, it's important not to over-consolidate too quickly, given where we are in the business cycle. The second question, therefore, is can you achieve uh, conso uh, consolidation without compression? And what do I mean by that? That typically consolidation means you're raising taxes or you're cutting expenditure. But this year, we're in a unique situation where the RBI dividend uh, has been double of what was budgeted in February. And much of that can be thought of as an asset sale. So in a, in a, in a, in a, what's, what's important to recognize this year is we could be in a situation where the government can take the deficit down from 5.6 to 5.1, but a lot of that happens through the dividend or asset sales, and therefore the contractionary impulse of that tightening is not felt, which is an important added advantage. The third question, therefore, is given that, uh, you know, what's happening on expenditure, uh, there's clearly a commitment to higher capital expenditure. We've seen that in the interim budget. I think that will continue. That's important. These long-term multipliers are, are large. Uh, but the fact that you have this dividend now means you have higher resources in July than you thought you had in February. And it will be good, I think, to allocate that uh, to you know non-capital expenditure uh, where multipliers can be higher. So revenue expenditure which was taking the brunt of the consolidation in February, will now have some more support. So in a sense, there are more fiscal degrees of freedom. You can bring the deficit down by half a percent, which is respectable. You can do it in a manner that's not contractionary per se. You're still increasing capital expenditure, and you're able to buffer yourself with consumption expenditure. But if I may just step back, I think markets are going to obsess about the near-term fiscal math. I think right. there are two broader questions we need to be asking. One is kind of the medium-term uh, fiscal strategy here. And you alluded to the fact that around the world post pandemic, everyone's debt level has gone up. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we need to ensure public debt gets stabilized. Now, how much of that is achieved through fiscal consolidation? And how much of that is achieved through the denominator where growth is stronger, right? And so we'll have to ask questions about the current fiscal glide path. Do we need to do more consolidation in the years to come? And my sense is probably yes. The question then is for an economy like India, where we need all these investments in health, in education, in infrastructure, in skilling, in the, in the, in, uh, the climate transition. You've got all these investments you have to make, and you also have to bring deficits down. And the only way to square that circle is to raise tax to GDP, which again is a more medium term question. Yes. Finally, I'll say there is the fiscal math question, no, both near term and medium term. But because this is the first uh, budget of the new government, I think equal attention will be paid to what's happening to the larger economic strategy, quite apart from the fiscal math. Right. Mr. Damodaran, on this issue of what is budget 2024 going to worry about the most? No, what budget 2024 needs to worry about is certainly unemployment. There are no jobs, price levels, the uh, inability, and in some cases, the unwillingness of individuals to spend because post COVID, there is a behavioral pattern that we're noticing. Some people think the next crisis might be around the corner. Therefore, I should not spend. I must invest in something which will protect my future. And therefore, there's no demand coming to the market. I think you mentioned that this is the first year of a five year term. So, this budget, even though it is envisaged, the budget is envisaged as a statement of the revenues and expenditure of the government should look beyond the first year and in some sense provide the direction for the next five years. I think this is the opportunity to clearly indicate that. Number two, on the subject of consolidation, I personally believe you should not tighten the belt too much. Because if you do that, there will be 
parts of the economy which will get hit disproportionately if you do that. My own view is not the larger canvas without addressing the specifics of your question is there is even though a lot of money you can't play around with because of interest, subsidies, pensions and a whole bunch of things which are charged and not voted items. So that's in any case fixed. Yeah. You can't play around with we that. We have about 15 percent yeah. which is but our degree I of freedom. But I still that's think it. if somebody adopted a zero-based approach to budgeting, you will find a lot of opportunities to cut unnecessary expenditure even today uh, in various departments and that is going to generate the money you need for better things. There's one point on taxation since it was mentioned is that I think we've reached a stage where indirect taxation is becoming bigger and therefore it's disproportionately hitting the poor. It is regressive at the end of the day. So, so no, I, I want to I want to push back just a little bit on the GST. You're saying it is regressive, but we have a progressive GST rate structure where consumption goods are zero and luxury goods are taxed very high. So, I what. Isn't it true that we've built in progressivity into an indirect tax? Not as much as one would like to see because today the consumption pattern of even the poorer people takes in commodities, things that they aspire to have and obviously they end up coughing more money. If you look at the direct taxes, I think you could do more on direct taxes. I am a great believer in reducing tax rates and scrapping all your Deductions, deductions and exemptions. Which is the new that. tax regime just, that we just have. Just scrap that uh, and then see how much money comes. And people will okay. sleep better uh, because you don't have to calculate how what deduction you can resort to where. Financial engineering will be a little less and therefore it will be possible to do that. But I worry really about lack of demand, which is what you started out with. Because how do you really generate demand in a situation where you're moving away from what we did during COVID, which was really trying to give an artificial boost to the economy. All countries did that. So when what you're scaling that? back, you really have a problem there. And uh, I think it's important really to see how much you can do without causing significant disruption in the way, in the very fine balance that is there. Just a couple of points, excellent points that Amazon made. I think one is to recognize that there's some encouraging progress being made on taxes. So this year, gross tax to GDP, center and states for the first time ever could surpass 18% of GDP. We still have a lot to do, but the last time we were close to this was 2007 at 17.9%. Now I completely agree that we should be focusing on direct taxes. I think the issue about injecting progressivity into an indirect tax is at the cost of simplicity and you have a very complex system, right? And so what you want to do is not overload multiple objectives on any one instrument. Indirect taxes should be simple, they should be broad based, right? And we should focus on direct taxes when it comes to progressivity. But I think the broader point's an important one. You know, I've been writing for the last few months, when we talk about private investment, it's important to identify what is the binding constraint on private investment. Because if there is limited political capital and limited state capacity, you want to focus your efforts on alleviating binding constraints. The good news is the supply side has been healed over the last decade. The um, twin balance sheet twin issues. Twin balance sheet problem. Corporate yeah. debt is down, right. the lowest in 10 years. Yeah. Profits have been healthy. Cash balances are high. Banks so are why do a, why are we not Cost seeing of credit. Exactly. capital? Because in my mind, it's a demand visibility issue. Okay. Now, there are two parts to this. Yeah. One is we live in a world in which China has massive excess capacity mm -hmm. because Chinese-owned demand is disappointed and the supply side has been strong. And so China is exporting both that excess capacity and the deflation that comes with it, right? And countries as far apart as Brazil are complaining about Chinese dumping. India's bilateral trade deficit with China last year was 2.4% of GDP, among the highest in the last 10 years. So if you're a corporate of India and your balance sheets are strong, but if utilization rates for manufacturing have been range bound at 73, 74%, haven't broken out decisively, core inflation is running at 3%, the lowest in 11, 12 years. That's good for consumers, but from a firm's perspective, that's telling me I have no pricing power, right? Nominal sales growth, profits have been strong because costs have been low. Top line growth in the last four quarters, nominal has been below 10%. So if you're a firm in India, 
it makes perfect sense to wait and watch because you're seeing that demand is now a binding constraint. And I've got this excess capacity from China, which is spilling into India through imports and keeping inflation contained. I think the budget's challenge is the cyclical help for demand, both monetary and fiscal, is limited. Cyclical instruments did what they had to do in the pandemic. Explain so the, cyclical So when I say cyclical, I mean that mm -hmm. the fiscal stimulus widened, expenditure yeah. levels went up. Right? There was welfare support provided at the bottom of the pyramid. Interest rates were slashed. Real rates for much of 21, 22 were minus 300 basis points. There was cyclical support. Now, for macroeconomic stability, for debt sustainability, we have to reverse some of that stimulus as is happening around the world. So for me, the real question in the next 6, 12, 18 months is how do we structurally boost demand without the benefit of just a little bit of monetary easing and fiscal widening? Can we do something to boost demand, consumption and exports more structurally, which then leads to more private investment and you get into a virtuous cycle? Any answers, Aniranjan, for yeah, so this? First of all, just taking off from mm. <clears throat> the excellent points which Mr. Damodaran and Sajid uh, made, I think one is uh, taking off from what Mr. Damodaran said about this being the first budget of a new government, so the long-term strategy. I think raising the tax GDP ratio without raising tax rates is going to be a big part of the challenge of the next, uh, you know, and uh, next 10 years. I think that generally there is a tendency for taxes to grow faster than the underlying economy once you reach a certain level of development and you see uh, tax elasticity which is uh, the amount of tax raised for every unit level in GDP increase has been more than one. So even GST which we all agree is a little too messy. After the pandemic, GST collections have been growing faster than the underlying uh, GDP. So I think you know, we need to uh, spend more on health and education, on infrastructure, on climate transition and on defense because the defense budget currently leaves no place for modernization. You know? So I think the only way to do that is to raise the, uh, you know, get the tax to GDP ratio up. On the issue of GST, I think GST reform is perhaps, to my mind, the most important And issue. when you say reform, you mean rationalization, rationalization of the rates? Rationalization of the GST. Because what yeah. happened is GST started in a slightly complicated manner, perhaps to bring all the states on board. You know, uh, there was a lot of political bargaining. Because that, that is exactly my question, is that it's a political issue? Yeah, and in 2019, ah. there were these tax cuts which sort of brought the effective GST below the so-called revenue neutral rate. I think that the GST, you know, need not be progressive. I think the analytical mistake is that every instrument of yours need not be progressive. The question is, is the whole fiscal system progressive? So in terms of, you know, not just each tax doesn't have to be progressive, the entire tax structure, so which means more from direct and less from indirect and on your spending side, whether you're spending for the poorest. So I think there's an analytical mistake underlying this complicated uh, GST structure. So I think that it's important that certain, you know, tax reforms are brought up front. On the investment side, I agree with Sajid, we are in the middle of what is being called the second China shock, right? And uh, some countries are responding by putting up tariff barriers. I don't know whether this is a sustainable uh, strategy for various reasons. It's looking very much like yeah. 1930. So, what, so what's happening is that actually private investment as a percent of GDP has recovered but it's largely coming from households. Business investment actually within the private investment uh, thing has lagged and I think it's a joke right. All us economists every year we say that now the private investment cycle has turned and I think we see, keep I, I've, seeing I've green count, shoots. I've lost count of the number of times but, I've been proved wrong on but, this. But uh, are we agreed that we are not seeing private investment? So there are two things if I may just huh. come in. Yeah. I think that we have to be careful about even the measurements. Uh, you know, we look at the RBI's capacity utilization numbers, which is largely the capacity utilization of existing factories and existing sectors. There's a lot of investment happening in new sectors, you know, means green energy for one, electric vehicles. I don't think that is captured in the RBI's capacity utilization data. But that said, you look at the any sort of data, you know, you look at the CMI type of data, which is comes from the uh, balance sheets of the large of 
large uh, number of companies or you look at the uh, you know CSO data about Indian national income statistics, we don't see a meaningful increase in uh, private uh, sector, uh, non-household uh, capital uh, spending. And that, that apparently we will see if we see better consumption demand. Yeah. But consumption demand is both domestic and export. Export is not something which is happening today. And domestic demand is down because according to me, I think people are paying off pandemic debt. I don't know, would you agree with that, that we've seen the, the household debt numbers very differently than what they were before. So household consumption and savings both are suffering because of this repayment of debt. So several layers here to unpack. I think first yeah. on the issue of are we seeing uh, investment? I think if you look at the government's most detailed breakdown of gross fixed capital formation, the good news is it's gone up by 2% of GDP over the last two, three years. But that's but, government induced. Correct. But of that yeah. 2%, more than a percentage point is the public sector. And we're seeing real estate. So the good news is at least real estate, both on residential and now on commercial, is there some pickup. That's the good news. As Niranjan rightly said, we have to look at corporate investment, which is the other leg to this, which has been very flat around 12% of GDP. And I'm glad that there's a progressive realization that the constraint there is demand. I think first recognizing what the constraint is. Now, I think if you, know, if you just think of GDP as being on the expenditure side, consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports. In looking at investment, investment is what economists call, sorry for the jargon, endogenous. It happens in response to something else. So you need either C or, 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 yeah. or, or, or G or X, X to fire. Yeah. And so far, it's been G. Hmm. But as we began the conversation, G now has to retreat Correct. for other reasons. That's right. So now has yeah. to be C or X. Yes. On C, you're right. I think there are many factors here. We've seen this dualistic consumption pattern where upper end income yes. wealth effects are strong. Yes. Income picked up, right? Upper end had excess saving. So as Niranjan recently pointed out, the RBI said those excess savings are being run down. So you're getting some segments of upper end consumption. For me, it's the mass market consumption which needs to pick up. There was a belief that if only the top 30% were to spend, we don't really don't need the rest. And, and I was never a votary of that view. And unfortunately, we've, been, we've shown that aggregate consumption over the last five years has been just over 4% because it hasn't been broad enough. Now, over any period of time, consumption is a factor of income. Right. And the best form of income here is job creation. Job creation. So it goes we back will, to Niranjan's first point right. that maybe for a year or two, consumption was weak in 2019 because the financial system was super tight. Now that constraint has gone away. Personal loans are very strong. So despite easing of the financial system, if consumption is still not as strong as we want or broad as we want, it suggests that you need income growth to pick up. One last point I'll make on exports using this number, only 13 miracle economies since the Second World War have grown at 7% or more for 25 years. Only 13 such instances in the last 100 years. There was one thing common in all those 13, right? Strong exports. Strong exports. So we should have okay. another conversation because yeah. there, are, there is a lot of export pessimism in this increasingly deglobalized world. Correct. If Mr. Trump becomes president, that's going to get accentuated. But I think there are export opportunities, both in services and goods, that India needs to exploit going forward as a source of demand. Yeah. So as we wrap up the first part, I think there is a consensus around the table that issues in front of, front of this budget are consumption and private sector investment. I want to now talk about something which is very politically charged. There is this idea that India has growth, but with increased inequality. But when I look at unbiased data, let's be, I'm sure we can agree that World Bank data is a good data set to use. And when I look at a metric of inequality called the Gini coefficient, which is income inequality, I'm seeing India actually doing better than many countries and we have a falling Gini coefficient ratio which essentially means that in income inequality has fallen in the last few years. So maybe starting with you, how do we think of this issue of growing inequality? We are getting growth. I think uh, notwithstanding what any report might say, there is inequality, big time inequality. We may be better off than other countries. If you compare with what some other countries are doing, clearly you might be better off. But that doesn't mean we've addressed that issue. The real problem is that if a country as vast and as diverse as this has to progress, you've got to carry people in the fourth quartile, the third quartile. It can't be just those that are doing well who do better. This is one of the problems. The second issue is that I think a lot of hope is being pinned unfairly on the government for creating jobs. 
it's not the government's job to keep on creating jobs. What the government needs to do and what we've not done enough of in the last 20 years, maybe even more, we've not invested enough in skill development. So we only scratch the surface. Are you skilling people to become self-employed? Why do they need jobs? Because if the right kind of skills are imparted and there is a clear indication given to those that are receiving that training or that development input that this is going to equip them to earn a living and not look at the government. At one time, the public sector in fact sank only because it was seen as a job creation mechanism. What they were expected to produce, they forgot about, but they just kept on employing people and then obviously uh, it will fail. Now, government should not take on a disproportionate burden, just create jobs. Let's talk about defense. I think the only way that modern defense forces have to structure themselves is less people and more automation. That, that is what you need, more mechanization, more sophisticated uh, weaponry and equipment and having foot soldiers going around and doing what we they were doing. We need more drones. It's, it's, Maybe more drones because ultimately an army exists to defend the nation as well as to attack those who misbehave, right? Now, uh, for both of these, you can't have just more people. Uh, now, it's going to get worse if the Agnivir scheme is going to be abandoned or modified because the pension hit that the forces were taking. They're not stating it. That was the only reason they did this. Instead of saying we don't want the work to uh, force to bloat. Uh, again, because of political compulsions, if there is right. some kind of scaling back. back or four years become six years, you're going to have an issue. There is a problem you mentioned of growth. Jobless growth is an expression we've heard in some sectors at least for many years now. So the jobs will not come where they were coming from earlier. That, that is certain. The second is inequality exists. You can't wish that away. The but problem... So so there is no society which is going to be fully equal. It, it is an acceptable equal. amount of less, inequality. Less inequal than it was the day before yesterday. Right. Can, can, we, can we move in that direction? What has caused that once we do that? I like the point that was made. There is an admission that there is a problem. Because I, the way I look at problems is you must have diagnosis, then prescription and then treatment. Yeah, but... So the diagnosis is my admission that, yes, I know what the problem is and therefore I'm going to yeah. do something to fix it. Other issue that arising out of all of these is the center-state relationship. We don't need to be as populist as you are in a year of general elections. This budget is post-election budget. But there's still major states that are going there. So you will get state-specific populism in the state budgets, aided, of course, by the center. The states don't have budgets to speak about unless the center is uh, helping them with the money. So you will see elements of populism. But in year one of a five-year term, years four and five of any ministry is going to be populist. We There's didn't no see that. We, but we, we didn't. That, and, but not, we didn't see it in, in terim budget. It was... Before the election, we we Interim didn't see it. Limitations. I mean, there was we didn't see it in the last budget. We saw yeah. fiscal consolidation. So I take your point, but Sajid, I want to ask years you. Yes, four and five will be a write-off as far as you know, uh, logical prioritization for investment, etc. Will go. There will be populism, right. but uh, year this one, we have an opportunity. Year one of the budget, yeah. I think we need to shed populism and do what we think is right, prioritize better. We don't have, uh, I think, adequate prioritization of budget. Right. So, do you agree that, so I'm going to keep pushing back on this to argue that on the metric that most economists agree that a Gini coefficient of 40 or below is acceptable inequality because a society can never be fully equal. Okay. That, that's a premise. How much is acceptable? Apparently, 40 or below. We are at somewhere 32, declining from, it was earlier, 34. And whatever poverty statistic that you pick up from whoever, we are below 10, extreme poverty. We are looking at the income group of between 5 lakh to 25 lakh over a 10-year period, which has seen a CAGR of a 25% growth in terms of their incomes. Does it not point to 
people doing better generally, that inequality will remain. So, so, so that's, that's very some very important points you made. So there's no question that progress has been made. I think that we all have to admit. The question is, uh, you know, how much more we have to do. Clearly, progress has been made. But I think for me, the 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 the, the, the puzzle here is the consumption puzzle. Right. That you know, as incomes okay. have improved, why are we not seeing consumption Fair move enough. up in tandem? Right. And that tells us that more needs to be done. Now we have to also admit, COVID around the world, not just India, was very Darwinian. It was very survival of the fittest. And so you've seen that exacerbate cleavages around the world, large firms, small firms, formal, informal, upper income, lower income. So countries have had to mitigate that. Right. And, and again, the way to do sustainable healing is through job creation. Now, this, this debate about you know, growth and uh, inequality, that there's a trade-off, is a false debate. It's not that you're going to have lower inequality if you're going to have uh, lower growth. Mm. Right? right? Growth is a necessary, may not Correct. be a sufficient condition, but a necessary condition because it gives you the resources to try and address the problem. The main point I want to make is that if you're thinking about job creation and employment as a means to reducing inequality, boosting consumption, increasing livelihoods, what troubles me is something over the last 25 years, where if you look at uh, ASI data, the annual survey of industries, and look at manufacturing, what you see is in a country which is very labor abundant, and the last 30 years we've been going through this demographic transition, so there are more people entering the labor force, What's been worrying is our manufacturing has been becoming more and more capital intensive. Correct. Capital labor ratios are increasing. Now, if we want to boost employment, the questions we need to ask ourselves is why is Indian capital shying away from labor? That's the fundamental question. How much of this has to do on the supply side, right? How much of this is education? How much of this is skilling? How much of this is health? How much of this is saying, search costs and reservation wages? How much of this is on the demand side, where you know uh, there are frictions associated with labor as a factor of production, and that's making labor more expensive? How much of this has to do with the incentive structure to be more capital intensive, more labor intensive? These are the fundamental questions I think that we need to answer over the next five years. My short point is job creation sustainably is going to, is going to involve making labor a more attractive factor of production. We want to be using relatively... Right. Less cap, less machines and more workers. And this is tough because given the non-linear rate of technological progress, capital productivity is just going to keep rising. And so we have to keep pushing labor up so that that capital labor ratio is redressed and doesn't get completely skewed. Yeah, I'll come, I'll circle back Will to that this make point. us less competitive internationally? Not if yeah. China is focused on very capital intensive sectors. So, so stepping back, we're already showing that our labor can make us more competitive by looking at what's happening in services. Right. JP Morgan used to have 30,000 people in India in the back office five years ago. We now have 60,000 people here. All of our global equity research, legal, accounting, technology, cybersecurity, card structuring, risk management happens here. So skilled labor is a huge advantage. And one last point I'll make is, even on the manufacturing side, there are opportunities on the labor intensive exports because China has pivoted, given its demography, to more capital intensive stuff. EVs, solar panels, very capital intensive. And they vacated a lot of space in the more labor intensive stuff, apparels, textiles, leather, gems and jewelry, plastics. That's the space that we should seek to occupy if we can make labor more attractive as a factor of production. On the growth and inequality, I'll just finish with this before I open another part of this. A couple of things first, you know, I agree with uh, Sajid and in fact, the point you also made that there has been progress and I think the drop in absolute poverty is without a doubt great. You cannot dispute it now, you right? The Gini coefficient, I would be a little careful in interpreting because India uh, calculates consumption uh, inequality. We don't calculate Into income inequality. And considering the fact that the rich save more, consumption is more, you know, equal than income. But that said, I think that, see, Stepping back a bit, if you look at the process of growth or development, what basically happens, at least in the early stages, is people move from low productivity sectors to high productivity sectors. And how quickly they move will determine your inequality because the high productivity sectors by definition have higher incomes, right? So what's happened in India is that this process is not fast enough. So you can actually have fast growth and 
you know lower inequality if more people are quickly moving into the high productivity sectors which again goes back to our uh, job creation issue on the issue of a couple of issues just taking off from sajid's points on the issue of unemployment actually if you look at indian unemployment patterns it's like an inverted u in the sense that the people who are highly skilled get jobs easily the people who have no skills get jobs easily it's this middle which is what we see in all these lakhs of people queuing up for a job for police constable or you know a government job i think that this is where the real employment crisis is while we need to move even the low skilled uh, very low skilled people into better jobs so the question is why isn't india creating those jobs and i just want to go back to those 13 countries which sajid mentioned which had export led growth china being the latest one common thing besides them being export led is that they were very aggressive in managing their exchange rates so if you have domestic constraints which are raising your cost of production it could be power it could be lack of infrastructure it could be low skill, you know productivity the way to correct it at a macro level is to depreciate your exchange rate i don't know if uh, sajid would agree so i think there is an exchange rate issue which i think explains part of our so rather than think of ex, you know exports i i think just this distribution between whether money is going to tradable sectors or non tradable sectors and you see even large indian companies they're investing in telecom in retail in uh, uh, infrastructure uh, in banking so these are all domestic non tradable sectors i don't think we have large investments in the tradable uh, sector the last point i think uh, it is important that inequality you know whether it's consumption inequality or income inequality at the household level we also have to think of the balance between capital income and labor income and i think sajid and i have both wrote this you know uh, two years or three years ago that especially the recovery after the pandemic has been profit led you know profits have increased and companies have used those profits to deleverage or to just build up their uh, cash reserves so there's no investment and labor incomes if you look at the plfs data etc real incomes have stagnated so i think there is that type of inequality as well this uh, besides the household inequality right so because uh, when there is a narrative which becomes a political issue of inequality then there's pressure on an occasion like the budget to do welfare spending and i let me complete the circle of this argument which is that so there is free food or there is freebie subsidies it sort of discourages labor to work because you're already getting so much free stuff then we can circle back to say that the jobs problem that we are talking about is it an unemployment problem or is it a skill problem or a unwillingness to work problem how would you context or all that? of the above all of the above okay yeah because that last that last part is also important That the, there are to, people. You know, it's not an Indian thing. You go, you go to. Uh, but we are at two thousand dollars per cap capita income. You will find they are hiring, and no, but, there are lots of people who don't have jobs. Yeah. Nobody goes there. No, so but if I'm at sixty thousand dollars per capita income, I have social security. That's I'm what I'm saying. Two thousand dollars. Therefore, why should you go and work? All I'm getting is free food grain. Yes. Is that? So I'm trying to piece this yeah, together. So Is that I'm enough? I'm not convinced that we have enough evidence because there's an identification problem here. Okay. Over the last four or five years, we've seen. I would argue that in fact we were more prudent fiscally in the pandemic. It wasn't like the U.S. where there was so much fiscal yeah. support provided that there was a clear disincentive not to work because you have this massive war chest of FX, excess savings. It wasn't clear that Indian households at the bottom had all these excess savings because if they was, mass consumption would not be solved. So several things have happened in in the last two three years that you've had demand for jobs. Demand has been softer as we've agreed. Yes, some more targeted support has been given in India, right? And we've got this more secular problem of a skill mismatch. So because there are three proximate reasons why unemployment hasn't picked up, I think it's a we need more evidence to say that reservations have picked up and people are unwilling to work. Okay. Because that doesn't match with the fact that fiscal support is more temporary, and if that was the case, then we have an unemployment insurance mechanism which is NREGA. Mm-hmm. And what we've seen is, if this was just a general unwillingness to work, right? I would have seen NREGA being acyclical. Okay. 
would stay at a certain level. The fact that Enrega has been more cyclical, when you've had a deficient monsoon, demand has gone up in the last few months as the recovery is progressing, demand has gone down, tells me I'm not convinced that it's just high reservation wages. I think those goes back to A, is there demand for jobs? Are we creating jobs in labor intensive sectors versus capital intensive sectors? And then the long standing problem of the skills mismatch. Right, Niranjan, on this issue of this no, I, I, argument. I agree. I think uh, the skills mismatch, at least at the level of industry, is deaf. And in fact, uh, I've had uh, senior people in even real estate uh, tell me that, you know, you can't get you know, good bricklayers or plumbers or so it, it the skills mismatch is definitely an issue. The other thing, interestingly, I, I don't know whether it actually directly answers your question is that if you look at the unemployment data, one thing I said is that, you know, the poorly educated, the, you know, people who have no skills and people who have high skills get jobs, but the poorly, you know, the middle is an issue. There is some evidence that Unemployment, youth unemployment is very high in the early 20s, you know, so 21 to 26, 27. And then it suddenly magically drops off, you know, and one possible explanation is that there's a whole generation of people vying for government jobs, you know, so they're spending those five years of their lives trying to get a government job, which often at that level pays higher than a comparable job in the private sector with guaranteed uh, you know, job security, some social security. So I think it's a complicated issue. Uh, I, you know, I would agree with Mr. Damodaran that it's a, it's a whole combination of issues. And I think it's, it's something which is a central problem which Indian policymakers will have to grapple with in the next 10 years. Because if you can't eventually provide that stepping stone to a young population, there are all sorts of other risks which uh, come into play. So I think this uh, jobs issue is definitely something which needs to be, uh, you know, uh, whether uh, we've never thought of it right now, but uh, like I, I, I said, I, I said that, you know, exchange rate is one way, some sort of a wage subsidy, we've got capital subsidies through the PLI system, you know, so whether some sort of wage subsidy where uh, government says that for the first three years, we'll basically pick up, uh, you know, some part of uh, the wage bill of new employees. I don't know, I means this has to be thought through, but uh, till you get, till people get jobs, the political demand for handouts will always be there, you know. Just at one point, I think it's also, you know, in India, nobody is just sitting idle. There's always, it's something. a question of quality of jobs here. Yeah. There's always, right. always underemployment. Okay, right. And what we're seeing is at least some of the efforts the government has made has begun to bear fruit because construction jobs have looked, have picked up. If you look at the PLFS over the last four or five years, the big infrastructure push and now the real estate cycle, uh, uh, you know, both residential and commercial picking up has been a bit of a magnet and therefore demand for Enrega has gone down. We, so, so, so there's been some progress from you know rural to construction, but we have to go to the next level. It has to be manufacturing, high value added services. So for me, it's the productivity of labor and increasing the quality of jobs. Uh, people always have something to do. Yeah, just taking off from what you said, and this is something we all know that for a government job, there are lacks of applicants. What do they like about it? They like the security. They like the benefits. Now here is a proposition that I think this is my personal view after talking to a lot of people, corruption adds about 10% to the cost of a company. And we cannot deny that there is corruption at every level. To do anything in India, it needs a handout. If we were to tackle this basic cancer, we the corporate then has an extra elbow room to give labor the kind of benefits they're looking for. What do they want? Even gig workers, they would like health insurance. They would like a decent place to stay. What is my incentive as a rural worker to leave my hometown where at least I get food, to come to a hobble in a city. And so just a, just a comment on so, what can we know, do Monica, about this? I, I really think a lot also goes with this entire issue of risk appetite because the pandemic was such a tough experience for people stranded in cities without any sort of social protection. And actually, uh, my firm, we did a large project for a multilateral agency to look at how well uh, the standard social security system in India, so whatever it is, works for unorganized workers and uh, migrant workers. And it doesn't, you know, because 
PDA, we, of course, there have been things like one nation, one ration card, etc. But just access to PDS, access to ICDS, these are core parts of our social protection system, which at least our research shows did not work very well for migrants, did not work very well for informal sector. So I think there's also risk aversion perhaps in people who have gone back to the safety of their village or their uh, farm where they can get uh, some NREGS work, some free food, some work on the local infrastructure, you know, road project or whatever. This is, I'm just second guessing, you know, but I think what you're saying is correct, you know, that there may be also an element of risk aversion so that when jobs open up to make that, that transition to back, come back maybe, yeah. and then that circles back it into being a state issue. Because urban infrastructure will finally be a state so, issue. So this is a really important point because there may, no, there may be no reservation wage per se, but there could be this reservation wage between urban and rural because you've got this fallback in the Correct. rural economy. Yes. And so the, there could be this dislocation to move back to an urban area. But I would say the social protection matters hugely because look at China. Without that social protection, what are households doing? Precautionary savings have picked up, right? And so what if everybody is saving for themselves, A, it's suboptimal. And then even when income growth picks up, you tend to disproportionately save as you age and that depresses consumption. So it's really important to, uh, you know, have that social protection broaden. I think we again made progress, significant progress has been made. We need to keep going further. I think on the last issue about, you know, firms uh, providing uh, safety nets and insurance, ultimately this comes back to labor productivity. Because from a firm's perspective, if you have skilled labor who are, whose productivity levels are higher, you are far more incentivized to provide on, on the job training. Most training happens on the job, right? Uh, and uh, make uh, and provide the accompanying uh, benefits to workers. So again, first principles is let's boost education and skilling. The market will get, take care of the other things, despite the f uh, 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 not understand the fact that social protection has to pick up so that f uh, so that households don't engage in precautionary savings. So the reluctance of persons to go back from the village, having come. All the reasons that you set out are there. But in addition, there is a non-quantifiable, which is that if something has to happen to me, I'd rather it happens when I'm with my family rather than when I'm, you know, uh, living in the city. The other point you touched on, corruption. There will always be, I'm not justifying it, but there will always be corruption if there is a supply-demand mismatch for anything. There will be speed money paid, that's the other name for corruption. There will be things of that hap uh, that kind happen because uh, then competition gets a little less legal and a little yeah. more yeah. opportunistic. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this discussion by just getting views on, despite all these problems, how do you see India's GDP 10 years hence, FY35? Any numbers in your head? So <clears throat> I'm not a professional forecaster, so I don't have a statistical model, but I'm generally positive on the prospects for the Indian economy. Uh, we've been broadly averaging six and a half to 7% uh, in the past 20, 30 years. So I think that is a sustainable uh, growth rate for India. So I think by the end of this decade or perhaps the early years of next decade, I think India should make that transition from being a lower middle income country to an upper middle income country. During that time, issues of inclusion will matter, inclu uh, you know, job creation, etc., etc. But I think generally, uh, the Indian economy from a medium term perspective is very, very looking placed. good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Again, I think, you know, there have been deep investments made in the last 10 years to fix the supply side, right? That, uh, that the banking system, the twin balance sheet system is now alleviated. Uh, infrastructure is being built. The housing sector has been cleaned up. Housing is picking up. We've got this war chest of foreign exchange reserves. What all this does in my mind is increase the length of the business cycle. The speed bump that used to come sooner because supply was a binding constraint, right? Or we never had enough reserves or the current account deficit would suddenly blow up. Uh, that, 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 that the road is now longer. The speed will come later. I think the focus over the, the last 10 years was to fix the supply side. Right. I think the focus wow. in the coming years needs to be structurally boost demand and do all the things we can. If we can do that, I'll remain very optimistic that the growth cycle in the coming 10, 15 years, notwithstanding 
global pressures and global uncertainties can be very long. The potential of this economy is very high. If we can do some of these things, we can realize that potential. So, I think the real positive, why I am optimistic also that we will grow at a good rate and that will be sustainable is that there is continuity in policy. There is no disruption after the elections. If you had a major political disruption, then you don't know what kind of changes will take place. Notwithstanding the fact that the major political party does not have the numbers on its own, I think what we are going to see is some kind of continuity and discontinuity in policy is what hurts the most. Right. That's not going to happen. Right. Thank you so much, all of you. I think this was really a debate which has triggered all kind of further thoughts in my head. This was a fantastic discussion. I know I have learned a lot. I'm hoping you did too. Thank you for watching this and do come back for more soon.